this? Her name is Emma. She's been missing for 18 months this month. It's every parent's worst fear, a missing child, no matter how old that child may be. She went missing from Victoria at 8 o'clock. November 28th, and nobody has seen or heard from her since. In Shelley Filipoff's case, her child was 26 years old when she disappeared, walking slowly away into the night. Her mother hasn't given up finding her. Here, she scours the streets of Vancouver, a search fueled by a small hunch and a whole lot of hope. I, on my own, decided that Vancouver was a really reasonable place for Emma to be. So I went to Vancouver for two or three weeks. She's working on the premise that maybe Emma had a mental breakdown and maybe she has ended up living on the streets of Vancouver. I, I have a terrible fear that she has had such a breakdown that she doesn't know that she's missing and she may not even know who she is. Okay. Knowing that she had been in a shelter, knowing that she wasn't accessing her money in her bank account, knowing that she had lost her prepaid credit card, I decided that Perhaps my best bet was to spend time on the downtown east side where the homeless population um, congregate. But she concedes it's a long shot. So could Emma have ended up down here on the east side? Yeah, she could have. Breaks my heart. Sort of refutes the idea that this is a... Mike Arnfield is a former cold case police investigator. This is someone who, whatever happened to her, has slipped through society's fingers, so to speak. And Emma, at the end of the day, had people who helped her, but no one was really looking out for her. Now we have one sole advocate, her mother, uh, looking for answers. And I think the lesson here is that there are lots of Emmas out there. Can I give you a poster, even though sure. you've seen them all around? And uh... I spoke to many, many people, virtually all homeless, many with mental health issues, many with alcohol and drug abuse issues. It would be viewed by most as a really rough area when in fact really for me it wasn't. People were kind. I'm almost 80 percent sure that I've seen her in Vancouver. Okay, okay. Since Shelley launched her public campaign the tips have started coming in claiming Emma is alive and well and living in Vancouver or the dire claim she's a drug addict living with the homeless. Police suspect some people are merely trying to cash in on the $25,000 reward, but Shelley can't simply dismiss the tips. What if one of them were to lead her to Emma? At one point, I received a um, Facebook message from a couple, and they owned a little funky store in Vancouver near the downtown east side, but not in the downtown east side, called the Hits Boutique. And they sent me a message saying that a young-ish man had come in to their store carrying one of Emma's posters, and as he walked into the store, he was crumpling it and he tossed it on the counter where the cash was and said, this woman isn't missing, she's my girlfriend and she hates her family. And they found surveillance footage at a neighboring store of the man who be started to be known as the Green Shirt Man. CTV's Robert Buffum is following this story tonight and joins us live. Andrew, a year and a half ago, Emma Filipoff vanished without a trace. Since then, there has been an extensive search for her, but there's really been very little in the way of leads. Now, however, a Vancouver couple has come forward saying that that may have changed. After he left is when I, I pulled it together and I saw her face there and I recognized these images from a poster. This couple who run a store in Gastown says they had a bizarre encounter yesterday with the man in these surveillance images who claimed Filipov is alive and is his girlfriend. Oh, it's one of those missing persons posters, but the girl's not missing. She just hates her family. So it's tore it down and just throw it out. I rushed down thinking, this is it. We will, we will find Emma. Today I will have Emma. 
The store owners say they got a weird vibe from the man and took things very seriously. And I'm like, okay, we need to call 911 right now. They're frustrated by a lack of response from Vancouver police so far. We're just kind of still waiting for the police to show up and at least give us some sort of details. Victoria police aren't confirming whether the lead is bogus, but say they're pursuing it. We're certainly following up with our partners in Lower Mainland to uh, verify that tip. Meanwhile, Filipov's mother says she's grateful to the couple who immediately posted the images to Facebook and says wherever this tip leads, she won't stop her search. Andrew, when I spoke with Emma Filipov's mother earlier today, she said she has yet to hear from police about this latest tip. Vancouver police came the next day. They took 24 hours or more to get to the Hits Boutique to talk to them. And by then it was too late. They needed to respond immediately. I mean, you know, it, it, we just don't know what could have happened had um, the right people done the right thing. And I tried, you know, I did my best, went around asking questions, went to the different businesses, you know, hoping he might still be around, that kind of thing. We made a poster of him trying very hard to show he had a lot of tattoos, and we thought that those were probably great for tracking down who he was. So we had a poster made with him in different angles. Um, we approached all the tattoo parlors that we could find and nobody could say oh yes that's that that's my work like so many other tips the man in the green shirt held out only momentary hope then disappeared police are still hoping to find him to ask him more about his story the fifth estate took the search to a different level the fifth estate is launching a special campaign to help find emma Filipov. the program wants your help by the way if you have any tips if you've seen emma if you believe you've seen emma go to our website right there finding emma the fifth estate documentary was seen countrywide if not a lot further so it was a really good shot at finding out perhaps who this man was i mean the way he spoke he seemed so convinced that this was true. I thought if I could meet with him, I might be able to ascertain if he suffered from any mental health issues uh, or drug or alcohol abuse. Um, would he continue to say the same thing? Would he continue to say that she's my girlfriend? Had he insisted that she was, would he have been willing to take me to where she was? That kind of thing. Um, nothing ever came of it, though. Nothing ever came of it. Did you ever hit a point where you just think it's time to stop? No. <laughs> no. That'll never happen. I don't know where I'll keep going, but that's not going to happen. That, that to me, would smack of, of giving up, and I cannot give up. Despite the fact that the surveillance footage was on the fifth estate, despite the fact that posters were made of images of him, we never found out who he was to this day. And that was a long time ago. And that was a long time ago. I'm Detective Constable Bob Isles with the Victoria Police Department's Major Crimes Unit, and I'm the primary investigator for Emma Philipoff's case. After he left is when I, I pulled it together and I saw her face there. We received reports of an agitated man in a Gastown clothing store with a crumpled up uh, missing poster for Emma in 2014. Uh, we've taken investigative steps, but so far he's not been identified and he hasn't come forward to make himself known. We've received a few tentative IDs, uh, but we haven't been able to confirm who he is yet. I don't think they're looked into thoroughly enough, in depth enough. In fairness, you know, maybe it wasn't an option to get a hold of these, you know, these people who with their tentative IDs. Yeah, I, I, I do remember my sense of frustration and, and, and a degree of anger that, you know, that they had waited that long and that this might have been the answer to all my questions, you know might have ended the search. 
I was kind of preparing myself mentally, emotionally for that to be what she would say is, I don't want to come home. I don't want to see you guys. The protracted efforts of this individual to make a spectacle of this and, and, and to offer specific case-related information uh, that he knows who she is, tearing down the signs with the narrative that stop doing this, stop looking for her, she doesn't want to be found, she's fine, uh, cut this out. I mean, he, there was clear messaging that went with this erratic behavior, but not the type of erratic, indiscriminate sort of mischief that you would often see associated with someone who's just uh, under the influence of drugs and, 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 and wreaking havoc. This had a, a certain, I think, for lack of a better word, and poorly executed, mind you, but almost a, a degree of, in this individual's mind, advocacy, if you will, and a very specific narrative to go with it. Could she have been with the green shirt guy? Possibly, yes, yes. Would it have been a voluntary association? Who knows? You know, if she was with him, perhaps he had some hold on her. Had she wanted to get in touch, needed to be translated in, had she been able to get in touch? You know, big difference. I don't think Emma is able to get in touch with us. I think otherwise she would be in touch. Mm -hmm. I do. I've always believed that, Kim. I've always believed that. One has to wonder if he's receiving direction to do this or, or whether this is something he's opted to do sort of proactively because uh, if there's a plan involved to cut ties, this sort of high profile presence of uh, Shelley and the corresponding media reportage is going to serve as an annoyance. My name is Dr. Michael Arnfield. I'm a professor and criminologist at Western University retired police officer and director of the Murder Accountability Project in Washington, D.C. I would suggest that, while not widely reported, certainly in my experience and in the experience of my colleagues, I don't know anyone in a high-profile missing persons case that has had somebody try to sabotage searches for that person and not be identified. And, and specifically sabotage efforts to locate that person with an explanation that they don't want to be found versus, say, someone just looking to interfere with the police investigation for more malicious or just mischievous purposes, including as maybe an accessory to a crime. In, in this case, we don't have that. We have a very largely unprecedented set of associated collateral behaviors that, that naturally make this individual someone very much worth identifying. If there is criminality involved, is he an accomplice and this is sort of a cover-up story? If it was the latter, you would think that you would just <laughs> sort of keep to yourself and not make waves and not draw attention to the fact that you knew something about this individual. So this tells me that um, this is arguably pretty compelling and that additional efforts should be undertaken to find this individual. To me, this individual is really sort of the, the missing link. We have this pretty clear footage of the guy in the green shirt. Yeah. Do you think you could create kind of a composite image of this man? Send me over the images and um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a crack at it for sure. I thought that was a really good idea because he was able to focus in on the details that we see, but that the general public might otherwise not see or, or notice. You know, for instance, the part in the hair. I think you'd have to look at the, um, the footage relatively closely to see those things. When you first contacted me, Kim, about um, updating the image, I thought that it would probably be a bit of a challenge due to the, the quality of the, the film and the, uh, the CCTV images. There was a, a few bits and pieces, like the, the lower face, exact shape of the tip of his nose and his mouth we couldn't be completely sure of 
But as far as the proportions of his face and the position of his features and the size of his nose, the size of his eyes, eyebrows, a very distinctive hairline, either the scar or what we thought might have been a parting, and more likely looks like a scar. I thought they were all uh, pretty distinctive, so I figured I would just give it a go to try and make a, a clearer picture of um, of what he possibly looks like. The process that I took was to uh, study the original images and see what features I could take from those. Then one by one, piece by piece, I put them together a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, a bit like what I did with, with Emma's composite. To put a percentage on it, I'm about 75% happy that the image I've created is, is um, a likeness to the guy in the, uh, the store camera. I thought this was really well done, uh, a very rigorous thoughtful approach to, to how to develop a more usable image of, of what this person might look like uh, versus sort of the grainy CCTV image that uh, we've relied on thus far. Features about this man include the tattoos that are very prominent on his arms. From the surveillance footage we had discovered that he walked with a limp and in one of the pictures, I found that you could see that there was a discrepancy between the two legs. I don't know if it's just the way he was standing, but it looked like perhaps one leg was shorter than the other. There, there was something about the legs, for sure. It appeared that he was wearing a Bluetooth on his right ear. Um, the logo on his uh, shirt, on his T-shirt, turned out to be uh, Quicksilver the symbol for the surf apparel brand. So we thought perhaps that maybe he was a surfer. And the fact that he's got what appears to be a part, but in fact, when you focus in on it, it's much more likely to be a scar. So uh, some people suggested that perhaps that we were looking for somebody who had been in a bad accident, which would explain the leg and the scar in the hairline. Mr. Hugh Morrison's ongoing efforts to assist with this case with some really, I think, cutting edge and certain leading knowledge and expertise and tools of the trade to be able to create a, a composite image, an age enhanced composite image, both of the mystery man and uh, of Emma, uh, I, I think is, uh, has been a very valuable contribution to, to, this, to this investigation. I think the drawing gives such a, a better um, idea of what this guy might actually look like. It'll breathe new life into not only the green t-shirt guy uh, missing piece, but just into Emma's story in general. I hope that when this image is released um, to the public um, through this documentary and uh, hopefully the media, that someone is going to pick up on who this guy is, someone's going to recognize him. Um, there's bound to be at least several people who will know who this chap is. I would encourage those people to step forward and, uh, and, and speak up. I don't know the odds of him coming forward after all these years, but that's what my job is, is to keep following up on those leads and to keep looking until we find this person. Uh, if I'm able to, I'll let Shelley know when we identify him and speak with him. certain aspects of, of this case, uh, my hope comes and goes. I still have hope that Emma's going to phone me. I still have hope that one day she's going to say, hi, mom, it's me.
there are days where I'm thinking, maybe I'm just being a fool to continue to hope after almost 11 years. But um, that's all I have. If I don't have hope that Bob's going to get, you know, somebody um, getting in touch with a tip about the green shirt tie or that I think that Emma could call, possibly call or what else do I have? I don't have anything else. That's what I've got. I've got my love for Emma and my hope that I will find her or that she will find me, you know, either way, either way. You know, that's why I keep my landline. I, I can't get rid of my landline. Right. Because she doesn't have my cell phone number. How long have you had that same home phone number? Going on 32 years. <laughs>